wonderful worship this morning. So I was reading my Bible this morning, and I'm in the book of Joshua. And in this part that I'm reading, the Israelites have moved into the promised land. And you remember that God told them that he was going to give them the promised land, but they had to get rid of all of the people who were there living before them. And that was part of their covenant with God. Well, in comes these people called the Gibeonites, and they actually were from that area. But they went through all this elaborate stuff to make themselves look like they were weary travelers. And like they baked bread and let it sit for a few days. And, and they, then they came to Joshua and the Israelites and they said, We are weary travelers from a far, far land away from here. And we would like to be your servants because we've heard about your God. And Joshua and the elders were the church were kind of skeptical, right? And so they were asking them questions, and they examined the evidence that they had brought, and it all looked really real. And so Joshua said, okay, and we're going to make a covenant with you that you can stay and serve us and be among our people. And all of the leaders of Israel confirmed it. And it wasn't until after that that they discovered that the Gibeonites had been lying. That everything that they had told them was made up. It wasn't based in reality. It was one of the greatest misinformation campaigns ever created in the, ever recorded in the Bible, right? But what struck me about this passage is when you went up to where Joshua was talking to them, and the leaders were examining their evidence, the scripture says, but they never consulted the Lord. And so you see, because they never consulted God, they fell prey to the lies of the Gibeonites. And once they had discovered their mistake, it was really too late. They had already bought into the lies. They had already made a covenant before God, and they didn't want to go back on that covenant because they had made it before the Lord, and so they were stuck. And that just hit me this morning so hard. How many times do we step out and not consult the Lord? And then we're left dealing with the consequences of that for years and years to come. Sometimes generations and generations to come. Because we didn't stop to consult the Lord. And I think this is especially important for us to know. We have an enemy, my friends, who is the father of lies, right? That's how he works. He works in lies. He does not like the truth. And he will deceive you any way he can. And he will make it look like just right next to the truth, right? So it's easy for us to fall for it. And maybe that's how so many people we know follow blindly the lies that are being told because they did not consult with the Lord. If only we would stop and hear what he has to say to us. If only we could filter the things that are coming in our ears and the ways that our lives are going so that we could understand the truth instead of being deceived by the lies. Is that something that you would want? Do you want to walk in truth instead of falling for the lies? Well, if that's what you want, then what that requires is for us to walk in step with the Spirit. Because you see, Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, his Holy Spirit came down. So he's not with us in the flesh, but he's with us in the Spirit and if we will consult the Lord, if we will consult that spirit, he will guide us where we need to go. All we need to do is follow him step by step. And we may not see the whole picture at the time, but he will show us what we need to know. And this reminds me of a little adventure and that Elena and I had last week. We went horseback riding and we went on this trail, right? We didn't know where we were. But there was a guide in front of us. And so we were on our mighty steeds who were going at like slower than you can walk, I think. You know? 
Nonetheless, every step the guide took, we took behind her. So our horses knew where to step. There were places that were muddy. There were places where trees had fallen down. And there were places where they had changed the path. And we didn't know where to go. All we had to do was stay on our horses and follow the guide in front of us, step by step. That is so much like our life with Christ. If we will just stay right close with him and follow him step by step, then he will lead us where we need to go. And we don't have to worry about all the dangers that lie around us that we don't even see. You see, the guide knows. The guide knows where to step. The guide knows where the pitfalls are, where the dangers are, where horses will stop to graze even though you're telling them to go, right? The guide knows all of that stuff. And all we have to do is follow. I think our lives with Christ are a lot like that. He wants to lead us where we need to go. And along the way, he's going to equip us with everything we need for the life that comes after this one. Last week, we talked about how we were made to be royalty. How those believers who walk in step with him are being prepared because one day we're going to be co-heirs to the throne and reign with Jesus. And while that doesn't sound like something I really want to do, I'm much more uncomfortable with him reigning and me just hanging out. He says, no, I've called you to be my co-heirs and to reign with me in the throne room. And if that's the job we're going to have, then we have to be equipped. And what that means is that in this life, we are going to go through struggles and difficult paths and twists and turns and dangers we don't see. But if we will consult with the Lord along the way, he will lead us exactly where we need to go. To be who we need to be when that day comes. And so this morning, I want to bring to you a tool or a resource that I think can help you walk in step with Christ. And it's based on Galatians 5, 25, which says, Since we live by the Spirit, we should keep in step with the Spirit. And so this triangle that I'm going to show you today is something that I learned from a group I'm in called Ignite. So I didn't create this. I'm just sharing it with you today. But I think if you can remember this visual in your mind, it will help you to consult with the Lord every step of the way. So this is the triangle, and this is how it starts for most people. Now notice that there's me on the bottom left corner, do you see? And then there's God on the right corner over there, and then there's life coming up out of that. And for most people, I think this is what it looks like, do you? That really the most important part of that triangle is me over here. This is me. The center of my life is me. I'm a pretty good me. So I go to church. You know, I go visit God sometimes. I talk to him sometimes. And, and so I'm just over here being the best me I can be, trying to make me happy. Maybe on Sundays I go to church. Or I read my Bibles. I certainly pray when I need something, right? But I'm over here being me. And then I'm over here living my life on this left side of the triangle. You see? I'm doing my life, and then when it gets hard, maybe I'll go ask God about it. But really, it's just me. That's what it looks like for a lot of people. And that me includes my plans, my dreams, my hopes, my goals, my desires, my difficulties. Does it make sense? Yeah? I'm over here being me. But this is not how God intends for us to live. Because if we're going to share the throne with him one day, we have to know how to walk in step with him. And you see, the me in this diagram is walking in step on my own. I'm figuring out where my next step is going to be. And that's not how God wants us. But you see, God hasn't called us into the kingdom of me. He's called us into the kingdom of God. And so let me show you this next triangle then. This is how we should be living. And so there's me, I'm still over there on the left side, but I'm not living on the left side anymore. Instead, I'm going to take myself to God over on the right side every day. 
I'm going to take myself over to God and say, God, I need your help. I want to be yours today. I want to live my life for you today. Tell me what that looks like. I'm taking myself to God. And the, the thing is, that's not just the pretty parts of me that I take to God. Because don't we like to take, God, did you see that I prayed before I ate my dinner today? Did you see that I sang pretty in worship today? You know, we like to take all the pretty parts of us to God. But really what this means is we take all of the parts of us to God. The secret parts. The parts that no one else knows about. The parts that maybe we're ashamed for everyone else to see. And so I take to him my disappointments, my temptations, my hurts. But I also take to him my desires, my dreams, and my goals. I bring myself to him because I want to please him first. And I want to be the me that he made me to be. So we live along that bottom of the triangle. God, show me who I'm supposed to be. Show me what to do with what's inside of me. Speak to me about the parts of me that are broken. Speak to me in the ways that no one else can because only you see what's really inside of me. And I bring those things to him so that I can get his perspective instead of my perspective. Does that make sense? And then, you see on the right side of the triangle, my life becomes out of that relationship that I have with God. So I'm no longer over here living life the way I want to. Instead, I'm over here with God going, okay, God, help me to live the life you have for me. My life is going to come out of my relationship with you. But you know what? Do you see how the arrows go both ways? It also means that I can take my life back to God for his perspective. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes in life, stuff happens that I don't understand. Things happen in my life that this is not how I would choose it to be. And if I'm left to interpret it on my own, I might believe the lies of the enemy about my life. But if I'm willing to take it to God, he can put it into his perspective. He can bring me his understanding. And he can say, child, you see, your life is not a mistake. And you're not in it by yourself. And we can handle this together. Because I'm bringing my life to him. And so that's what it looks like to live on the right side of the triangle. And when we're living over there, when we bring our life to him, then everything looks different. Then I understand Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose for them. Really? Everything? Everything. Well, God, what about that thing that happened at work today? You use that for your glory? What about that person who wounded me? You're going to use that for your glory? How are you going to work that to my good? And you so I see, this is how I look at it. The stuff that I'm bringing to God on the bottom, that's all the stuff inside of me, right? But the stuff I'm taking from the top, that's all the stuff outside of me. That's all the stuff I can't control. That's where I take my husband and my children. That's where I take my job. That's where I take my vacation. That's where I take my addictions. You see? I take them all to him so that I can keep in step with him because he sees the big picture and he knows exactly what's going on in my life and he has a plan to work it all out for his good. But I have to make the choice. Am I going to live by his spirit? Am I going to consult the Lord? Or am I going to do it on my side, in my way? And my friends, I want you to know that his way is so much better. That in his way, there is peace. And his ways are different than the rest of the world. Let me read to you what it says in Galatians 5. This is starting with um, verse 16. My Bible, my Bible titles it, Living by the Spirit's Power. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. 
The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. That's why you need to consult the Lord, right? But when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, you will not get to the throne room that way. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there, them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. This is what it looks like to live on the right side of the triangle. So I get it. Do you? If I'm living on the right side, I'm submitting to God my plans and my purpose for life. Every aspect of my life, not just the Sunday morning part of my life, but every part of my life. And I don't have to be crushed or feel like a failure when I struggle because I understand that he can bring glory out of it. And then the joy of the Lord becomes my strength, right? I consult God, and when I do that, I don't come to him saying, that's not fair. Instead, I come to him saying, Lord, show me what you want me to learn from this. Train me in the midst of this trial so that I will be fully prepared for whatever it is you have in store for me. So that's what the triangle shows us. I bring myself to God, and I bring my life situations to God, and I let him speak into all of it. And I don't know, maybe you're left going, yeah, that sounds really good, but I don't know how to do that, right? So I'm going to give you a way to do it. And if, you want, if you're a writing down person, this is a good thing to write down because there's three steps to consulting the Lord with my life. The first thing we do is we name it. Name it. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, put a name on it. Put a label on it and be real about it. I need to put words to the feelings that I'm experiencing right now. I need to put words to whatever it is I'm dealing with inside of me. God, I am discouraged. God, I am angry. God, I am bitter. God, I've been running from you. God, I'm scared. God, I feel so hurt inside. Name it. And don't don't cop out with a, you know what I'm feeling, God. Yes, he does. He wants you to name it. Okay? That's how we name the things inside of us. We can also name the things going on in our life situations. God, this thing happened at work. Or God, I got accused of something I didn't do. Or my spouse didn't do what he said he would do. Or my neighbor set his sprinkler so that I get wet when I get in my car. You see, whatever that life situation is that I'm facing, I'm going to name it. This is the thing. So this is how I feel, and this is the thing, and I'm going to name it so that we can talk about it. God, this person posted a really bad picture of me on social media, and I am embarrassed by it. And you see, once you name it, then you can bring it to the Lord and start to work on it, right? As long as we're real about it. And now that we've brought it to the Lord and we've named it, the next step, step two, is we process it. We ask ourselves and we ask God, what is making me feel this way? 
What's causing this hurt or this fear or this embarrassment or this shame? We process it. Or why is this thing going on in life? Why is this thing happening to me? Did I do something to cause it? Did I not do something to cause it? You so, so now that we've named it, then we can process it. Okay, why? All right? Okay, so I'm really embarrassed about this picture on social media. Why, Lord? Because I have pride. Because I'm more worried about what I look than I am about the experiencing the people around me. You see, when I start to process it, I don't always come out on top of that, right? Or God, why is this thing in my life happening? Maybe it's because the people who are doing that thing are damaged and broken and don't know Jesus. And how many times do we see the woundedness in ourselves connected to woundedness from the generation before us? And we don't even see the, the woundedness that happened to them from the generation before. We need to process things. Why is this happening? I don't know why this is happening. Why am I feeling this way? Because I was taught to feel this way. Because my family always said, you know, don't let anybody share your business, right? Or always make sure you look good on the outside. Or, or, or we need to get revenge or whatever. You know, there's all these lies we believe that we were raised with. Anybody? Or don't talk about your emotions. That's, that's weak. We don't do that. You see, when I name it, I can start to process it. I can ask God. Why? Why, God? Show me why. And once I've named it and once I've processed it and maybe I've learned some things about me or some things about the other person that's involved, then I let God speak into it. That's number three. Let God speak into it. Well, God, what do you say? What do you say about it? I'm embarrassed about how that picture looked on social media because I'm prideful. I don't want people to think I don't look good. I mean, what does God say about that? God says, beauty's on the inside, and I don't look at the things that man looks like, looks at. And maybe you ought to be worried about those things. Right? When I let God speak into it, he brings clarity, and he shows me the wrong voices that I've been listening to in the process. Right? Because we can listen to some really bad voices, can't we? Sometimes those are the voices that we grew up with, the voices from our childhood that spoke the wrong things into us. Sometimes those voices are our own, the tracks that we've learned to play. But this is what I have observed in life, and this is what I know to be true. Sometimes it's the voice of the devil right out of hell, speaking into your life, trying to get you to believe the lies of the enemy. Because who lies? The enemy lies, right? And how does he do his work? By getting you to believe his lies, right? So when we take it to him and we process it and then we let him speak into it, you know what he says? That's a lie. That's not my voice. What does my voice say about it? What does my word say about it? When we go to God with our life that way, when we allow him to speak into it, then he teaches us how to walk out of it the way that he would. And so, my friends, are you feeling persecuted? Do you know what he says? Jesus says that you're blessed when you're persecuted because he was too. Feeling afraid? God says I don't have to be afraid because he'll go with me wherever I go. Feeling guilty or ashamed? He said, Jesus says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's not. You don't have to feel ashamed. You need to feel forgiven. And once you feel forgiven, your slate is wiped clean, right? That's what God says. Feeling tempted to do the wrong thing? The word says that he will always give you a way out so that you don't have to sin. Always. Don't buy into the lies that say that tell you everybody sins, it's okay. That's a lie from the enemy. Jesus said, I will always give you a way out. Feeling lonely? Scripture says God puts the lonely into families. Like this one. I don't have to be lonely. I can seek out my brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you grieving? God says it's okay. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
and he'll comfort us with his comfort so that we can pour it out on others who are going through the same thing. You see what happens when we let God speak into our lives. We name it, we process it, and we hear what he has to say. And if, if I were you, I'd do it all in a journal, writing it all down, especially as you're learning how to do that. One, name it. Here it is. Two, process it. Here's what I think about it. Number three, you speak into it, God. Here's what comes to my mind. Here's the scriptures that pop into my head. Here's the quote that I heard Pastor Kathy say on Sunday. Here's, here's what my Christian friend said when we prayed together. You see, let God speak into it. And a lot of times when you're writing, the words that come out on your page are not the words you thought in your head. And you look down and you go, surely that was the voice of God. And you see, that is how he guides us when we consult him that way. And maybe when we're starting out, we do that with the big things. God, what job do you want me to take? God, is this the person I'm supposed to marry? God, how do you want me to handle this temptation? You see, we can start out with those things. But over time, as we get accustomed to it, we do it throughout the day without even thinking about it. When life situations come, our first thought is, all right, God, I know you're going to work this to my good. What's that going to look like? Or I know, God, this thought came into my head, and it's not a pure thought that edifies you. What do you want me to do with that thought? You see? As you do it over time, you get so used to speaking to God that way and to consulting the Lord that way that it becomes a part of who you are. It's a part of your relationship with him, and it's how he guides you step by step through life. And so when you confront something and you see there's something that goes off in you, this is not of God. Okay, God, what's your, what's your way? Show me the way out. I don't have to live according to the sinful nature anymore because I'm going to live according to the spirit. And how do I do that? I let him guide me every step of the way because I am in step with him. Does that make sense? What are the three things? We're going to name it. We're going to process it. We're going to let God speak into it, right? My friends, that's it. If you never learn another thing in here, but you learn how to do that, do you think that your life could be different? Do you think that you could stay on the right path that God has for you? I think so. Does that mean you never have to face, face an, an ugly consequence again? No. God, I'm suffering right now. It's okay, I suffered too. My son suffered for you but I have something better in store on the other side. God, I'm unsure of what to do. It's okay. Just take this first step, and I'll, I'll plan out the next step for you. You want to walk in his step? This morning, we're going to go back to a time of worship. And if you don't know where to start, then can I just tell you the best place to consult the Lord is at an altar. A couple weeks ago, I was having a really rough week, and there was just some emotional things that were going on inside of me, and I kept trying to deal with them, and I was starting to name it and process a little bit, and then I took it to the altar. And I don't know how you feel about an altar, but for me, that's the place where I go to consult the Lord. That's the place where I go to say, God, this is something I can't handle, and I need you to speak into it. And sometimes that happens in the quiet of my study, but other times it happens in the presence of God's people with other people that I know are praying for me. And in the midst of his worship, and God says, here you go, my child. Here's what I need you to know. And so as we go to a time of worship, our altars are open. And if you have something you need to consult him with, that's why you come to an altar. And if you want to do that by yourself, you can come to this altar over here. If you want help praying, you can go to this altar over here, and we'll honor that. Don't turn away from him and walk your own path. Let's don't live on the left side of the triangle anymore. Let's bring our lives to God, can we? Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much that we don't have to fall prey to the lies of the enemy. We don't have to believe the lies that are inside of us. 
but that we can bring ourselves and our lives to you to hear what you have to say. And Lord, I speak on behalf of this congregation, I believe when I say we want to follow your footsteps. And so we ask, God, that you would just guide us and show us your path. Help us to be so in tune with your Holy Spirit that we don't take a step on our own, but we submit each one to you. And lead us along that path, even through the trials and through the suffering, through the hardships and through the celebrations. Help us to stay focused on you through it all. So that one day when it's our time to join you in that throne room for eternity, we'll be equipped as the heirs to your throne and the children of our creator. We love you, Lord. And we bring ourselves and all of our stuff to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?